afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you may be uh, in the world. Welcome to this uh, LinkedIn live streaming uh, event brought to you from the MIT Sloan School's Executive Education uh, Program. I'm Peter Hurst, Senior Associate Dean for Executive Education at the MIT Sloan School. Uh, and today uh, we're going to be talking about how to empower workforce uh, success uh, in this digital, this entirely digital world, perhaps, uh, that we're now uh, all a part of and experiencing. Uh, I am just delighted to be joined today by two leading experts from the MIT Sloan School uh, who are going to share with us uh, their thoughts about this topic and have a great conversation uh, and also really interact uh, with all of you uh, on this LinkedIn channel uh, today as we explore this topic. Uh, those two individuals uh, are Christine Deary, who uh, is uh, associated with the MIT Center for Information Systems Research. Uh, Christine, uh, her research uh, is really very much in the dynamic between uh, technology uh, and people. Uh, she's uh, studied this in really practical terms in many companies and organizations around the work in her various roles uh, in the past. And we'll be sharing some of those uh, insights uh, with us today. Uh, and Christine has been joined by Hal Gregerson. Uh, many of you also know Hal from his work in the MIT Leadership Center. Uh, both Christine and Hal uh, are extensive uh, contributors to our executive education work here at uh, the Sloan School. Uh, and uh, I will uh, leave Hal to introduce uh, some key ideas uh, in a moment. But before we do that, just a couple of housekeeping things. Please, first of all, uh, as I said, remember this is intended to be very interactive, so use the LinkedIn uh, functionality to uh, pose any questions that you may have, share any comments and thoughts. Uh, I will come back later on in this hour to help uh, Hal and Christine go through some of your questions and hopefully answer uh, some of them. Uh, and maybe we can start by asking you all a question, which is uh, just in the, in the LinkedIn chat, just to get that warmed up. Tell us very briefly, what is your role in, in your organization? Uh, why are you interested in this topic? Why did you join us today? And what are you hoping uh, you'll get out of uh, the next hour? So if you uh, perhaps just start responding uh, with your reactions to that question, I will hand over to Hal and Christine uh, to start a conversation and I will come back uh, in about 30 minutes to, uh, to help pose the questions that you're asking. So first up, uh, Hal, uh, I'd love to hear, you know, what are your uh, thoughts uh, to get us started in this conversation about how can we uh, ensure that our workforce is successful you know, in this transition to a digital world? Thank you, Peter. Um, in, in my work, and I think as well as Christine's, we've spent a lifetime trying to figure out how leaders navigate change. And in this particular instance, it's a very tight focus on digital change has happened, and how do we make our way through that in a really productive, successful way? Now, for me, at least personally, um, I suspect some of you would top what I'm going to say, but I've lived in 47 houses, 21 cities, and three continents, and worked at more universities than I can count. I'm delighted to be here at MIT at this point, but life has been a whole host of transitions, including cross-cultural, like, again, many of you. And um, what I realized early on last year in 2020 is that when COVID came and we went into lockdown around the world, it was like a cross-cultural transition. We were moving into the foreign country of coronavirus, and we all thought that we were going to easily move out of it by sometime in 2021. And now that is even complicated in its own way, as you well know. And in the midst of all that, we've had massive changes in the roles we play. And I can see the roles. We can see many of these roles of people around the world who are on this today. Um, those roles are the ones you're currently in. Our hunch is that the roles have changed over time. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But basically, we land in a new environment. In this case, digital change happens. Imagine it being a cross-cultural transition as we do something to, to take that digital change, be it machine learning implemented or whatever it might be in our organization, 
And then that has deep implications for us individually. Our roles change, the skill set we have and mindset needs to shift. And at the very core, the emotional roller coaster we go on during any transition, especially a significant one, has ups and downs, energy giving emotions and energy taking emotions. And so my work has been a very deep focused dive on given a big system level change, in this case, digitally driven, what are the implications for individuals? What are the implications first for the skills they're learning? They've got to acquire new skills when change happens by definition. And when skills start shifting, roles start changing. So we have to adjust to those. And as we're learning skills, which is a learning curve, and adjusting roles, which is a U cross-cultural adjustment curve, at every stage of that process, we are managing and channeling emotional energy, positive and negative, in order to move pr more productively forward. That's the essence of where my world is on this digital workforce and digital transition. People are full of, many people are full of fear approaching it. It literally is moving to a new space. And if we think of that skill set, role we're playing, and the uh, emotions we're dealing with, and consciously attend to those, it can make a huge difference. So that's a bit of my space. And Christine, what about yours or a response to that? Yeah, Hal, thank you. And what a great introduction to this session. Um, I'm a research scientist at uh, the MIT Center for Information Systems Research. So we look at organizations going through these kinds of transitions um, at an organizational level, but we look at it from a whole multiplicity of, of um, uh, perspectives. So my particular perspective is, is the people. I'm interested in what happens to our people as we go through some of these digital changes. What is it we need to focus on? Now, interestingly, I started the research, um, I've, I've been doing this for forever and, um, but last year was a particularly interesting year for, for all of us. And so as researchers, you know, it became incredibly fascinating to see what was happening. I started the, the year really looking at the original work that I had been doing on the employee experience. What technologies do we need? What kind of space do we need? How do we create this environment where people can work effectively? And we had two ways of thinking about that. One was um, what are the collective work habits that we need? We tend to refer to those culture as a collection of habits because we can then start thinking about how those habits can be changed. But also we know that habits tend to fall back onto what we used to, what we know and love, what we're familiar with. And when we go through change, we need a lot of support and help to acquire new habits. But that that is a very possible change that every one of us can make individually and collectively. So we used to look at, we, our previous work had looked very much at what those collective habits were on one side, and then what the, the work environment was like on the other side. So, um, you know, what did we need to provide in terms of space and technology to, to create this overall employee experience? But interesting, with COVID, we saw something really extraordinary happen. And I liken it to a the wormhole for any of you who are really interested in space research, you know, you'll know that this is a conceptual idea that um, scientists have that we that there is a, a transition from one state to another through this kind of portal or wormhole. And what we saw was companies being dragged into this wormhole. They had absolutely no choice. It was very chaotic in the beginning. They were being thrown around. They were being hit with things they'd never been hit before. And most of them started to steady the ship reasonably early on and were quite surprised at how easy it was to, well, not easy, but that they were able to uh, create this new working environment for their people. But then we started to see a really interesting thing happen. We started to see that companies that were more advanced in their digital transformation, we study large traditional companies that are making these transformations. So we learn from those digitally born, but we're really interested in what happens to those who are moving from this previous state to this new state. Um, what we saw was that 
that these companies that were more advanced, so had made more transitions, were more used to some of these transitions that you talk about, had developed their technologies already to a, a, a reasonably significant uh, state of transformation and their people were used to coming along on these journeys. They, in fact, used the wormhole to accelerate through into a new world of work. So a lot of the blockers that had been there in the past, a lot of the things that had made it hard for them to go that extra mile that they were looking for disappeared. And they were really using this to, to push this forward even harder uh, into this new world of work. And by the way, we're not quite sure what that new world of work is. We've got some ideas now. We've, we're starting to see how um, digitally transformed companies really work more effectively. But I think this has been a really interesting um, insight for us. And so it certainly pivoted my research last year. Well, Christine, what I, what I want to add, and it's really complementary to what you just described, is for the last no oh, 15 years, Clay Christensen, Jeff Dyer, and I have studied the most innovate, innovative companies in the world. Yeah. And we collaborated with Credit Suisse to do an analysis of an innovation premium. And these are large companies like the ones you've been studying. And what we were trying to figure out is which companies were investors willing to pay a premium for because they believed that that company would do something different in the future they've not, they're not doing today. And in the spirit of what you just described, Christine, two of those companies have been in the top 15 for the last 15 years and only two globally have been in that space the whole time. And one of them is Salesforce and the other is Amazon. Yeah. They're big companies. Granted, they have their own challenges and problems, but the reality is I think they're doing exactly what you just described, which is they were already in that digital space. They were driven by this way of looking at the world that says the following. <laughs> What's the challenge that's most crucial for the end user of whatever our product and service is? What's their biggest challenge? That becomes our biggest challenge. And then how can we take full advantage of everything we've got inside of this organization to solve that new challenge in a way that would do something different than we've never done before? And I've watched the same thing you described, which is if you go into that top tier, be the two companies I just described of the Kiens Corporation in Japan, which makes sensors for manufacturing environments, but it's one of the most innovative companies in the world. They have just, they have gone through these last 16, 18 months in a very different way because they already had an approach to the world that said, we're here to show up. What's the challenge? They're given the space to take tackle it. And that means when roles change and skills need to be learned and emotional, emotions need to be managed in that process, they already have an expertise in it that it's just like you said, it, it, it's the foundation from which we can navigate through not just digital transformation, but pandemic related. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I look at a company that we've studied for some time, um, DBS Bank in Singapore. Mm -hmm. DBS Bank, you know, 2009, most people know this story, but we're a very slow government-owned bank. Um, you know, we just, a, a cardigan and slippers bank, I would call it, for those of you who can kind of relate to that. <laughs> but this, is a, this was a bank that um, delivered solid results but was not going to set the world on fire. And Piyush Gupta took it over at that time and said, you know, the whole world of banking is going to change. But they had to shift a workforce that was very traditional, a very traditional hierarchical workforce to being one that was ready to shift into the world of digital, which meant they had to go from, a, you know, this very structured command and control type mm -hmm. of environment mm -hmm. to, you know, to test and learn. And, you know, we use those words quite flippantly, but it's an extremely difficult transition to make. I, I don't know about you, but I've been fascinated by the Olympics, as um, mm -hmm. a lot of people have been glued to that. But the, the new sports in particular are, um, present some very different principles. And one of the ones that I've become glued to is uh, the rock climbing. Now, what's really fascinating as an analogy that's going on in our own businesses is if you watch that sport, they have to sit back, they have to work out a pathway to get up a very, very difficult challenge. 
And then they have a go at it and they try and climb this rock face and they fall, sometimes very hard, and they fall publicly. But falling is not failing in that sport. Falling means you sit back, you have another look at it again, you learn from what you've just done and you go back up on that wall again and you have another go and you try and get to the next place, get your hand into the next rung. But you're falling publicly, this is a very, very different way of thinking about a sport. You know, compare that to something like equestrian that I've been involved in, you know, most of my life. And, you know, you fall in equestrian, you're eliminated, you're out. You don't get a chance to go back and try that again. In fact, they call it the walk of shame when you come back off the, off the cross-country course. So we want to create organisations that are more like these rock climbing walls, but we come from more of an environment that is much more like the equestrian in these big organisations. And that's perhaps one of the toughest um, transitions that these companies are going through. So in the spirit of that, Christine, thanks for sharing that. Um, one of the examples you mentioned just a moment ago was as you move a traditional organization into this digitally driven organization with a workforce that's engaged and excited about it, it's like one of the things you mentioned was it's this top-down command and control notion. And part of that top-down command and control is really I know what to do, therefore I tell you what to do. Yeah. That, that's a big part of that process. And so as, as this may sound simple, but it's often traumatic, which is, okay, that's my role in that traditional organization. Now we've got digital AI, whatever broadly defined coming into our space enabling people to know things, see things, and do things they couldn't do before. And now I need to be changing my role from that top-down tell approach to more of an ask and listen approach. And I'll never forget in Singapore, actually, where you were just describing, talking to a CEO who had been promoted his entire life for having the right answers. And then when he got to the top of the organization in the CEO role, he realized, oh no, there are no answers here. I've got to ask the right questions to figure out what to do in a world of unpredictability. And so he literally said, it's been excruciating to make that transition, to let go of the tell approach and move into the role of I am a listening leader. And one of the people that they've said I could tell their story is Brad, Cook, Brad excuse me, Scott Cook, who founded Intuit, a financial services company in that technology space. He's the founder, he's the chair, he's the chairman of the board. He walks into Brad Smith's office, who was the CEO for about a decade. At the beginning of that tenure for Brad, Scott would walk in and give Brad a list of things that he needed to work on that would make the either the organization better or do something good for the end user client. And Brad would take a deep breath, look at the list of 15 things that he'd been told effectively to do. And then there was all this fallout in the rest of the organization trying to figure out how do we shift and pivot for these new things that we've got to incorporate into the system. Well, what's really cool about Scott Cook is he's a learner. He approaches the world that way. He got some data from a 360 feedback signaling that this process was actually not very productive. And then he literally, imagine, wealthy executive chairman of the board of a successful company going to coaching for several years in order to change the conversation with his own CEO, which is effectively learning skills in order to change that role from top down to a very engaged questioning one. And so what happened is then Scott walks into Brad's office at the end of learning that skill, going up the learning curve, first knowing what to do and then getting the capability and doing it well. Then he walks into, into Brad's office and it's not, you know, here's what to do, but literally it's, what are you wrestling with, Brad? And then he shuts up and he just listens. And at the end of that, with some clarifying questions, it's a second question, how can I help move that challenge forward? And so it's a very concrete transition for Scott, trying to move things forward more productively in that digital world, 
by changing literally the role he was playing, ask versus tell, the skills he needed about the questions he was asking and not, and the emotions that was generating in himself in the system. Yeah, and these are very different ways of leading organizations. Like they're very different kinds of conversations. What, what we found though, we, we studied um, 1300 companies last year uh, when we wanted to know, you know what, what were the characteristics of these companies that were coming through the, this wormhole much faster. So companies like DBS that had, were really advanced in their transition, what were they doing to really accelerate this process? Mm -hmm. And you know, like the story you've just told, Hal, I think part of it is um, creating these different ways of, of leading in these organisations, asking different questions, leaders taking a much more supportive role and coaching role. And we certainly saw that. But we also saw that these companies were focused on two clear dimensions. And the first one was they, they were really digitizing work. So they were provisioning the tools, the capabilities, um, and they were making that very transparent to their people so that, that it was easy for people to find the tools that they needed to, to reimagine their work or to do their work much more effectively. Mm -hmm. But it was also easy for them to start uh, looking at that technology that underpinned processes, for example, and then be able to, because that was broken into components, being able to put those components together in new ways to redesign the work that they were doing. But to be able to do that, to really have those effective conversations. So in other words, a leader that's saying, you know, here's the nature of the problem, they go forth and find solutions for me, not, uh, not here's the solution, go forth and implement. They not, not only had to have that technology and access to the technology, but they also had to have these skills. And we call it digital fitness because this is not a process that um, requires, that there's a, a learning process of you, you acquire a skill, you wrote, learn a skill, you build that capability, and then you just kind of incrementally get better at it. Mm -hmm. This is a process of, it's like improvisation. If you think of in theatre or in um, dance, I learn my skills, I keep honing them, I keep building more and more skills. I learn to work with others in different ways and I keep building those capabilities until the point where we've got teams where we can present them with a problem, present them with the framing around the problem. You know, this is the, these are the, this is the frame. It, this is, it's not a free for all. Mm -hmm. This is the regulations or this is the requirements or the market or whatever it is that frames this problem. But within that, you leverage the skills of you and the people in your team to go out and and solve the problem. And that's what we found that these companies that were really accelerating through this wormhole were building this future ready workforce that of empowered problem solvers, where they hmm. could find the technology, they knew where to go to get it, and they knew what it could do. And then they were able to apply it in new ways because of all of these skills and capabilities that they had built to solve problems in very, very different ways. But most of our, our large companies are still in what we call passive recipients. They just receive the technology, this is more command and control, and they get better and better at using the tools that they've got. But that's it, they don't have any further control over that. Is there, is there, um, is, were there any specific skills in your research, Christine, that you discovered that these folks were using in digital transitions um, that were a bit surprising to you? Was there one that, oh, I didn't expect that one. Yeah, yeah that's a very, very good question. Uh -huh. um, I, I think uh, some of the things that are uh, surprising is that, that it's not just about the skills required to do your job of today. It's about some of these broader life skills. You know, it's about it's about pulling skills in from other things that you do, whether it be sport, whether it be theatre, whether it be, you know, ways of of interacting with people and creating these environments where people can work together. We talk about agile teams or agile methodology. That's just a method that underpins the way that people have to work. But when those teams come together. They, they really have to draw on not just the, the specific skills required to do the job, but this much broader set of skills. So when we're thinking about how do we create a rapid learning environment, we're really thinking about how do we ensure that our people remain curious 
curious not just about the world that they're in but about the broader the broader world so that they can bring in some of these new skills and capabilities to work effectively together so that kind of narrow view of building skills that we've had in traditional organizations what we see in these other more um, future ready type companies is that they're really broadening that skill base well thanks for sharing that i mean in one sense just a quick example of something we already kind of know. I did not know how to wash my hands properly at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Very specific skill. One mm -hmm. of our daughters is an RN nurse in a surgery room. She came over and taught us the proper way of washing in between fingers, this way, thumbs, fingernails, the whole process. And at the end of that, I did it conscientiously for a number of months and then it slipped. And so the point here is the following very specific skill, purposeful for the very specific situation, new skill that I never really knew. And there are three questions that I've found and we found in our research that we need to ask about a skill development, which is, what is the work to be done? What is the skill that I now need that I didn't have before? In that case, it was hand washing capability. Can I do it? Do I have the soap? Do I have hot water? Do I have a towel? Do I have a way of measuring how long I'm going to be doing this? Okay, I can do it. I'm going to now try it over and over and over. And then it's a question of, do I have the motivation, internal and external, to keep doing it over a long period of time? And so that's something with an S-curve or learning curve, everyone on this call, I think, is very aware of. And you're right, Christine, that it's a that makes sense for something very specific like washing our hands. But then you've got a skill you mentioned towards the end, which is a more life learning skill, being curious, being inquisitive. And it could be as simple as how do I ask better questions? That's the skill I want to learn. And one of the people we interviewed in the research that work that we were doing in cybersecurity, they are realizing as they work closer and closer with data science and the data scientists, and they're working together to try to figure out where are the bad folks, what are they doing, why are they doing it, what's their intent, they have to be asking faster and better questions than the bad folks in order to stay ahead. And so they're like, how do we build that capability? And so the question becomes, now that I know how to, now I know that's important, Christine, on that skill, that's a life skill, in fact, but crucial for this digital workforce, how do I build that? And there are things we can do, much of which you just described, which is basically get out into the world as much as you possibly can in a diverse place where you're dead wrong, you're uncomfortable, and you shut up and be reflectively quiet. And when that happens, you start asking different questions. And one of the things we use in the program here at MIT that I've also used personally now for 20 years to build that very specific skill of questioning is literally asking nothing but questions about a challenge. And so given any challenge any of us have on this LinkedIn event today, you and I included, Christine, if we stop for just one to four minutes and ask nothing but questions, no answers, no explanations to it, we'll get about five questions per minute and 85% of the time, we will ask a different question that will help us nudge and move forward with progress because we've built that muscle of curiosity and inquiry. And so one of the things that I think would be really fun is to ask the folks, what are, what's one of your big challenges that you're facing right now, managing or leading a digital workforce Christine, you and I pick one of those real quickly. And, and then we take 60 seconds to ask all the questions we possibly can, and they can add questions in too in the, in the comment area. Sound good? Sounds good to me. Give it a try? Yep. So anyone willing to type in their biggest challenge in a digital workforce? We would love to see one of yours. While everyone's thinking about that, Hal, um, 
you know, one of the things that you raise is to do with you know, when we think about just the simple thing like hand washing. These become habits, right? These are deeply ingrained habits, but you mm -hmm. see how quickly those you fall back on those habits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the process of learning, learning how to ask questions, learning how to change these habits um, is what we're seeing in these companies like DBS, Carmax, other companies that are really have really pushed their digital transformation forward is that they become they become very good at coaching um, but they also become very very good at uh, learning by doing yeah. so you know like the rock climbers they sit back they look at the problem again they get up there they have another go and they they keep learning by doing as opposed to classroom learning and i think that's part of this questions right mm -hmm. learning how to ask questions is learning by doing it well, and I'm, I'm with you fully on that, which is basically what's the challenge and let's get out of our chairs and do something actively about it. Yeah. And, and so yeah. one of the challenges I noticed through through several of these is maintaining emotional engagement of my people in this hybrid or pandemic world. So, folks, we're going to stop asking, putting challenges up there. Christine and I are going to take 60 seconds. I'm going to look at my watch here. And um, we're going to generate as many questions as we can, Christine, about the challenge of how do I get deeper emotional engagement of my people when we're working online like this? You ready? Yep. Here we go. Okay. What do I know about you? What do I see on your screen that I've never seen before? What are the things that... I know that you're finding hard. And have I asked you the right questions about those? Who are you? <laughs> what would you like to be in this world, this pandemic world? What makes you happy? What makes life hard? What exhausts you? What data do you need to do your job more effectively? What's getting in your way to be more engaged? How can I be a better leader for you? What challenge do you most care about? What are the things that we as an organization are doing to help you? And then what are the things we're doing that is making your life hard? How do you feel right now? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it? Now, yeah. I'm going to, that's about a minute. And at the end, I had forgotten some questions, which some, some ideas. And so here's, here's that process for me, Christine, right there, took me to a different place for a moment. And what I remembered was Nikki Sparshot became the CEO of Unilever New Zealand, Australia, a week before the pandemic lockdown. She's run her organization virtually for the last year. She's retitled herself as the chief energy officer. If she were on a call with you right now, Christine, before pandemic, her questions at the beginning would have been, okay, what are we gonna do? And how are we going to do it? And she said, I completely flipped it to who are you and, and why do you show up at work? Hmm. What's your why? Who are you? What's your why? And she said, by starting with those questions and paying attention to the painting, for example, behind you. Is there a story about that painting, Christine? Oh. Yeah, there's very much a story behind this painting. Could you briefly share the story? I'll very briefly share. This painting is painted by a guy called Angus Watson, who was a skier in New Zealand many years ago and had a tragic accident and became mm. a paraplegic and took up art. Mm. And he now paints these amazing pictures that are a combination of reality and impressionism. Wow. And is there a meaning of that to you that is beyond the painting? Oh, yeah, I just think the spirit of people who don't let things get them down, who mm. come up and fight for another day. But you can't fight the same battles that you were fighting before. You can't be the same person you were before. You have to think mm. about the world very differently.
And I like that. Christine, thank you for answering those questions in a public space like this. And this was what Nikki was telling us. She said, and she used this word intentionally, I have more intimacy with my people with this process than I did in person. I take the time to learn about their world. And I now, I feel more connected to you, Christine, by doing what we just did. And that then leads to the place where we can ask those honest questions. Where are you emotionally? How do you feel right now? And do you want to talk about it? Now, we're at MIT, so you know it's like we often don't talk about feelings here. Mm -hmm. But I think Christine would agree with me on this, that being able to create a safe enough space for people to say, here's how I really feel, and yeah, I do want to talk about it with you, it may sound soft, but it is the hard rock bedrock foundation of these things that we're talking about, us being able to take up the courage, literally, to try that new skill, small or lifetime, to, to take on that new role that, frankly, could scare me to death as, as yeah. you've brought this technology into my space. And I completely agree. You raise a good point because creating these safe spaces, we found that to be a really important part of learning organisations. It's safe to ask questions. It's okay to fall off the wall. It's not an issue for you to say you don't know how to do something. This is an environment that they are building. And we can use those words often, but in fact, some of the actions that we have within the organization, ways of uh, rewarding people, ways of assessing people, ways of um, of of determining the, the the boundaries around which they'll work, you know, are often run contrary to the rhetoric of saying it's okay to fail, it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to ask questions when you don't know how to do something. You know, this is, I think we have to really think about what that looks like. That exercise that we just did. It's actually hard to sit back and think about what are the questions I want to ask. And one of the reasons it's hard is because in some ways there's a little voice inside of you that says, I'm not sure I want to know the answer to this because I'm going to have to <laughs> about it, right? <laughs> so we have to create that safe environment. Well, and what's really interesting is um, about two weeks ago, I had a very thoughtful conversation with Amy Edmondson who for most of her life has studied psychological safety and um, her great book, The Fearless Organization. Um, but Amy and I were talking about the intersection of her psychological safety and fearless organization work with my inquiry work. And specifically that process I just described, they call a question burst, a burst of questions. And what I've discovered over 20 years and probably 30,000 leaders is I watch in the room the psychological safety on average going up, even amongst strangers, by sitting down with somebody else, revealing this is the challenge that I'm wrestling, meaning I don't know, I'm wrong about something, and I'm trying to figure it out. And then that process of only asking questions requires us to shut up and not give answers and many times it causes a lot of discomfort because I realize, wow, I'm a bigger part of this problem than I thought I was. But at the end of that, 80, I, we've got data on this, 85% of the time, people are at a better emotional state, which is part of that emotional engagement process. They have reframed the problem and they have at least one idea to move forward. And so, what Amy and I were talking about was how might this simple act of question bursting help us build even deeper psychological safety across an unsafe system? And it may sound like a, a, a management trick, a consulting game or whatever, but all I know is if I'm, if I'm currently in that traditional top-down organization, and I'm wrestling with this digital workforce and transition set of issues, it could be a starting point, which is, what are our challenges? 
what's your challenge? What's mine? You take a couple of minutes to explain it. Let's just ask nothing but questions. It builds engagement in ways that is, is pretty surprising. Yeah, I, I think this is really exciting. And I think this fits really well into the work that we've done and where we've seen that these companies, 22% of these 1,300 companies that we study globally, um, that are building these empowered problem solvers. And this is not you know, a fixed state. This is a constantly iterating state of people learning, uh, becoming better at asking questions, becoming much better at at uh, being able to use the technologies in new ways in order to create and reimagine new ways of working. These companies are outperforming their competitors in terms of re new revenue streams by by nearly twenty percent. Hmm. So. This is, you know, and, and they at the same time, they're pulling out costs. So innovation, people being able to solve problems in new ways, be new, really innovative about how they go about and be empowered to be innovative, not only enables new products and services and therefore new revenue streams, but it also enables them to do it at a much lower cost. Mm -hmm. So you know, our data is pretty clear on that now. And um so this is this is a real thing for enterprises. I think often this can be, you know, well, yeah, it would be a nice thing to do, but we haven't got time. We're so busy. We've got so much going on. You know, we'd love to be able to sit down and focus well, on, you know, <laughs> creating more empowered problem solvers. But our data is showing this is not a nice, just a, you know, nice thing to have. This is really going to build value for organizations. Well, we don't have time to get into it, and it's part of a role-related change, especially for senior leaders, is most of what I see with how people are using digital, AI, ML, whatever you want to put into that box, most of the ways that senior leaders are using it are really to um, give them good answers. But very few people have thought about, how could I leverage that at the senior level to actually ask the better question. I love that. And I think it's a sign of deep maturity within a digital workforce that we're not only using these things to get that 22% bump on effectiveness you just described, which is a lot of that's bottom line stuff, but it's more top line thinking around what are the different questions we could ask because of what we're now learning from this digital experience and being very conscious about it. Yeah. Which again is part of that role shift, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna portray a scenario just real quickly, Christine, and tell me, given the you you've talked and interviewed and and collected data from a lot of different leaders and organizations, here would be my recommendation for anyone trying to navigate that digital world better. If I'm a leader of a group of people, what's the challenge I care about? that would require this team to actually give their skills and energy to it and want to. And if I don't have a good challenge that pulls them into the challenge, not me, the challenge, that's the starting point. So now we've got a challenge and the next piece becomes, I know what your individual challenges are as well. So I've gotten to know you well enough, Christine, to know what are the biggest challenges you're facing in the midst of the work we're doing right now and going into. And then I probably also know, whoa, you're really good at this skill and mindset and habit, but not so good at that because it's new. Mm -hmm. How can I help you learn that new skill set? You, Christine, not just some generic workforce, but Christine. And then it's when you start learning those different skills, it's, oh my, this means I'm a different Christine now. Mm -hmm. I'm not what I once was, and this role is very different. And I like the old one, but I also like the new one. And now I'm going through that culture shock of who am I and what am I becoming? But I, as a leader, am aware of that wrestle. And we have those conversations often enough where you're comfortable saying to me, here's how I feel, Hal, excited today, or man, I'm just down for this reason. It's that all levels of the system running where I'm paying attention to your role, I'm attending to your skill and, and, and habits and so on, 
but I'm also emotionally aware. And when that's in place, driven by that challenge, then it works. Yeah, yeah. Um, DBS had a program called Digify, and that ended in FY. And the FY stood for for you, not for DBS, for you. This is a program of learning, of building curiosity, of learning by doing, of sharing, of building knowledge, because we need to become a different bank. We need to become a digital bank. They are now the, have been in the last few years in a row declared the best digital bank in the world, by the way. Mm -hmm. But they have done it with a program called Digify Digital For You. And you build mm -hmm. your skills because you have to change and we're going to help you. We're going to provide you with all the ways of learning. Mm -hmm. But we're also going to stand around. We're not going to expect you to, to acquire these new habits immediately. We're going to support you and help you. You know, it's like smokers, I believe, never having been one. But <laughs> you'll keep falling <laughs> off the wagon, right? You will go back to what you know. And that's a natural human trait. Now we have to give you the support, ask the right questions. Are you okay? What do you need? Um, how can we make life helpful, better for you so that you can move forward? But, but here's the point, though. They made it very clear to their people that you will move forward. You know, you, will, you do need to transition into this, into this digital world. That is not an option. But we're going to help you and we're going to provide you and support you to do that. Well, and, and I think, you know, in the spirit of what you just described, um, it reminds me of a quote that I actually have on the wall because it was so profound for me. Um, in talking with Jeff Wilkie, who recently retired as the CEO of Amazon Worldwide, which is a huge swath of the company, I asked him, you know, how do you ask the better question and how and 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 in order to take full advantage of all the digital elements of the world you're in the middle of and 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 he literally said if you never ask questions you never experiencing anything new your mental model becomes stale it's like when we're building a model for machine learning that's what he's doing. It's like, I'm building, I, I have this mental model, it's becoming stale. But he said, if you seek out things that you don't know, in other words, I don't know, you have the courage to be wrong, to be ignorant, to have to ask more questions, maybe be embarrassed socially, then I think you'll build a more complete model and that will serve you well over the course of your life. And, and so it's literally taking all those concepts of machine learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning, and embedding that into how I approach the world. I mean, how we're seeing that companies are looking at things like building a curiosity index. And I think there's been a few companies playing with this for a little while now. Mm -hmm. One of the indicators, if you think about a dashboard, how curious is our organization? Ask that mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. One of the indicators of that could well be how good are we at asking questions? How often? Do Absolutely. We ask? No, I'm with yeah. you. Speaking of questions, we yes. would, let's let's invite Peter back into our space, and is. we have probably gazillions of questions that I've seen. Peter, we'd love to um, hear what you think and what you might have to ask. Thank you, Hal. Thank you, Christine. Yes, indeed, we have a lot of questions, and uh, if I may, this has been extraordinary already. Um, you know, the exec ed team, I suppose, asked a question which would was what would happen if we put Christine Deary and Hal Gregerson on a stage together, even virtually, and had a conversation like this. Uh, and I don't think any of us could have imagined the, uh, what a powerful conversation that you ended up uh, having. So first of all, thank you for that. Uh, and now let's try to get to some of the themes that are coming out of the questions, many of which I think you have actually covered in different ways as you as you've had this conversation but perhaps worth uh, worth bringing uh, out again and one that i think early on uh, margot and also lucy uh, asked uh, about one of their uh, challenges and many other people have asked versions of this question during the course of your discussion as well uh, which is we all uh, hear there are these 
people call digital natives, and then we all sort of believe that we are, you know, have more seasoned managers and executives and so forth who perhaps by definition are not digital natives. Uh, and it seems like there is both an understanding and a communication gap between those two different uh, populations. Yeah. So what further advice, if any, do you, do you have? And is that actually an accurate segmentation from what you're seeing in the work that you're doing with companies and with people in, in companies? And if it is, what are you seeing uh, working uh, to try to bridge those kinds of divides? I mean, my really fast response, and it leads into Christine's cool research, which is, okay, that that divide, between, if it's a digital divide and those who are not, that's happening from my perspective because that organization is internal process politics driven and it's not challenge external customer oriented. And as soon as you make that switch to where that kind of customer focus is paramount. The digital divide is there, but it's acknowledged in a way that like, let's now do something about that in order to solve this challenge for that end user. And I really love Christine's research around, they, they take two angles often in organizations. One is towards the customer and using all this effort to do something better for the customer. And the other is for, the employee. And if we're trying to, to solve the challenges that matter to customers and employees, that digital divide, it almost sounds magical, will likely disappear. But if we don't have that kind of a focus, it's going to be internal, ego-driven, politics-centric, and that divide will continue. Yeah, we certainly saw, Hal, I agree with you, we certainly saw that companies that um, were, had these empowered workforces. In other words, they had what we would call a future-ready workforce and kept iterating around that. One of the things that they were over 30% better at than their competitors was really having the customer at the centre of the circle. But here's the thing. If the customer is at the centre of the circle, so are your employees because they have to have the capabilities in order to be able to deliver. We're going to, we're going to automate and digitize everything that's replicable and easy for our firms to do. The thing that we're going to need humans to be able to do much more effectively to leverage those technologies to be able to deliver on is solving more complex problems for the customer. And, and I agree with you, this opens up the question constantly in organizations, you know, how do we create this level of digital fitness right across our organization, not just in pockets? And we see all sorts of techniques to do that. But, um, you know, reverse mentoring, um, the curiosity index, I think, is a really powerful way of thinking about this. You know, how do we get people asking more questions? How do we make it safe to learn? But the big thing that I see in every one of these organizations is they make it fun. They make it fun for everybody. And if it's fun, you know, then somehow you unlock the courage and the willingness to absorb these new capabilities. So it's, it's a matter of the organization embracing this, this connection between the customer and the employee and they're opening up these new questions about the digital divide that will bring that together. And one sentence, Peter, before the next question. I think the fun comes when the challenge is interesting and that's why we show up. If we're showing up to help you, the boss's career, get a progress, that's yeah. not fun. <laughs> Peter, go ahead. I think that that's very, even more timely given the experience of the last year or so when we're really hearing about a lot of people that feel like they have choices now as well right and so i think it connects very much you know and following on christine from what you were talking about uh, umberto asked a couple of uh, really i think helpful questions one is you know if people are buying into uh, this idea of digital fitness digital readiness what are some of the ways that you have found have been most sort of practical and effective to assess uh, and, and if you like measure uh, or estimate what is our digital effectiveness and having done that you know what are you seeing is sort of how long does it take uh, to if you put in place all the kinds of uh, ideas that you're recommending you know it, are, are these overnight transitions or does it take years it, it, it certainly takes time 
I mean, you know, we've got, we're changing people's habits, we're changing their skills. But I think most companies have found that this has been faster than they've thought, and they've certainly seen an acceleration over this uh, pandemic time where people's skills have changed much more rapidly than they ever believed were possible prior to that. But let me just just make one comment. Uh, there's the one piece of advice I would give on rapid fitness, um, rapid learning to create this digital fitness, it would be this. Measure the outputs, not the inputs. We in organizations typically measure badges. I, had, I grew up with brothers. They were all in the Boy Scouts. They used to go off and they used to get these badges and they would sew them on this blanket. And that apparently when you put the blanket up at Jamboree showed what a good Boy Scout you were. The point was they would have a sewing badge, which meant they once sewed on a button. They've never been able to do anything with the needle and thread ever since, and they would have no clue how to apply that learning beyond sewing on that one button to get that badge. Now, I'm exaggerating, but... In organizations, we tend to measure inputs of le learning and development. You go to a course, you get a badge, you know, that creates a new opportunity for you, another course, and so on. And you collect a series of these badges. What we are seeing in these more advanced digital organizations is they're looking at how do you apply that learning? The badge is not important. We don't care that you've got the badge. What we care about is how you take that badge and you apply it to a problem. So you know, that I, that's what I would really encourage you to start measuring how the learning creates value. How, measure the outputs, not the inputs. Um, digital fitness for me is um, deeply entwined with innovation fitness. Um, and, and hopefully the digital is helping us generate new ideas that are valuable, period. And so then, you know, part of innovation is asking questions, getting out there and observing, talking to different people, rapidly experimenting, divergently in associational thinking. They're skills. They're very tangible. They're real. They help us do that. Um, but underneath all of that, it's like, what is my relationship with digital? That may sound like a weird question, but it's it's like, what's my relationship with Peter Hurst? What's my relationship with Christine Derry? What's my relationship with my wife? What's my relationship with digital? And I, I, I'm, I'm serious about that. And so my suggestion is the following. Um, take, take stock. Do a bit of a historical analysis. Over the course of time, what has your relationship been with digital? Positive, negative, neutral. What about the people you work with? What's their relationship been over time? And then some really interesting indicators that, that signal we might be getting closer to digital fitness would be doing what I call a question audit. Just, just record for 24 hours all the questions that come into you and all the questions that come out of you, including the ones in your head you don't ask. Then at the end of the day, look at those questions. What percentage of those are digital related? What percent of those are leveraging some form of this new digital world we're in to do something better and different? And if I look at that audit and the questions that are coming in and out don't have that orientation, we've got issues. And if they do have that orientation, then it's like, okay, are those questions primarily efficiency focused? Are we just trying to do the same thing better and more efficiently? And then, you know, it could be, oh, that's good, but that's starting. That, that's the foundation baseline. What, you know, are any of our questions trying to leverage digital in order to do something radically different? And that can be a really powerful way to see this. That's great. I think that's uh, that's very insightful. Thank you. Thank you both. And just a couple of minutes left, perhaps, uh, you know, talking about change there, Hal, and uh, you know, the importance of changing ourselves as much as changing, uh, transforming organizations. Uh, I think Orlando earlier on uh, in, in the uh, conversation made a point that he himself is someone who's found himself with career uh, and uh, you know, his, his historical line of work has really uh, been impacted in this case by the pandemic, but it could have been by digital disruption, I suppose, as well. Uh, and having to completely change direction, he's, be, he's training now to become a web developer. Uh, and, and so implicit to me in that is kind of the question of, 
you know, what is uh, your experience uh, in terms of the companies and the people within the companies that you've been uh, studying? And, and what's your you know, advice as leaders yourselves in uh, this, this idea of uh, digital transformation is also a personal transformation for us. And that's uh, maybe very daunting. Uh, maybe many people feel that that opportunity has already passed them by. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Um, first of all, for whatever reason, I was thinking of Clay Christensen, a good friend and colleague of mine who passed away last year during the pandemic, um, not from the pandemic, but from other illnesses. And um, I really honor Clay. And Clay, Clay often said, management is a noble profession. It's an honorable profession if we do it right and do it well. And, you know, I, my hope would be for the people you're describing, Peter, who are in this massive transition now from COVID, from, from digital, from whatever, where they're moving from one place to the other, my first hope would be that they have a manager who is noble and honorable. And what that would mean is they get to know that person well enough to know who, are, who is this person, what is their role, where do they want to go, What's their purpose? What are their values? What matters most? What are their skills? How could I help? When are they up? When are they down? How can I support that? That feels like I'm holding hands, but in fact, it's not. I do not know those things to do their work. I know those things to help them become better. And, you know, if, if we're doing that well, we have a portfolio of people that we work with, peers, even bosses or direct reports who are becoming better because we did just what I described. And when they hit these moments where massive changes happen, they will be less disrupted than those who have less noble managers, frankly. Great, thank you. Christine? Yeah, Peter, just one final comment because I know we're, uh, we're out of time, but um, I, I completely agree with Hal, but I think there are some structural issues too that we've, I've seen organisations put in place that provide people with the space to learn and grow. Hmm. So, you know, creating environments where you, not only can you build new skills within the learning and development environment of the organisation, we're self-directed from the employee, but also you get opportunities to be able to apply those skills to learn how to be something else. I, I saw a great example in India when someone who had been an accountant all their lives, he was in his 60s, mm. and went off, learned AI through their learning and development platform, but then had the opportunity to go and work in the AI area for half a day a week. He ended up as the head of AI for that organisation because he could leverage years of wisdom, years of understanding of the company, now with a new set of skills, completely reinvented. But the company had a structure in place to allow that to happen. And what that meant was that even if you didn't have a manager that was of the wonderful ilk that Hal just described, there were mechanisms and there were pathways within the organization to grow and learn. And I think that's really important as well. Great. Great. Uh, as you said, Christine, we're just about out of time. So it really remains for me to uh, thank both of you uh, very sincerely on behalf of all of the uh, people who've joined us from literally all over the world for the past uh, hour or so. Uh, thank all of you uh, that have uh, tuned in and joined and helped uh, stimulate this conversation with the great questions that, that you've been uh, asking. Uh, I, I think we, I had uh, no idea what a powerful session this was going to uh, be. I should have known better, but, but truly thank you uh, both for provoking some uh, really important questions uh, for all of us to be uh, considering and maybe we'll help we'll, we'll help come up with the answers to uh, some of those questions uh, and no doubt we'll generate many more questions in, in, in the process and uh, we are a great debt uh, thanks to you Christine and Hal for helping us make sense of the world in a, such a practical MIT mind and hand kind of way. So thank you all uh, for joining us. Hope to see you uh, at a future LinkedIn Live event and webinar, uh, or indeed uh, in our virtual classrooms uh, in MIT Sloan Executive Education. And one day before too long, uh, back on campus 
uh, in person as well as something we're all also looking forward to uh, so that we can have our biological as well as digital uh, connections uh, resume. Thanks, Peter.